Welcome to Into the Wilderness Shorts, a concise installment of science in conservation. I'm your host, Byron Pace. It is the 4th of June, 2020, and this show is all about mercury in our oceans. It is a little more technical than normal, so I'm going to do my best to condense a fascinating conversation that I had with university professor Zhen Shu Zhang, who had been a postdoctoral researcher at Harvard University when he worked on a paper Global Biochemical Cycles, Mercury Sources, Distribution, and Bioavailability in the Northern Pacific Ocean. Insights from data and models. The link to this paper is in the show notes on the pacebrothers.com website. Now, my interest in this topic, beyond the fact that it is important for us to understand, given how much of our food is sourced from the ocean, was an article that I put together from Modern Huntsman on whale hunting in the Faroes. Now, this will be out uh, in the next couple of weeks, actually, from when this podcast goes out, because we are in design, and it is an article in uh, the latest volume five. The story was largely based around an incredible documentary by a friend, Mike Day. Uh, The documentary was called The Islands and the Whales. Uh, We've mentioned it on this podcast before. And what was at the core of this was the long-term study of the effects of low-dose exposure to mercury through whale meat consumption. For 25 years, a toxicologist on the islands had been testing mercury concentrations and monitoring the effects on the Faroese community. And although large-dose mercury poisoning had been well-documented, there had never been a study looking at long-term low-dose exposure. His research showed that by the age of 14 years old, cognitive impairments were being recorded in the population, with a doubling of mercury levels relating to a reduction in childhood development, the equivalent of a month of cognitive learning. Children there were being born with 40 times the background level of expected mercury in their system, with older community members experiencing more than two times the rate of heart complications and Parkinson's disease. as are two symptoms associated with long-term mercury poisoning. If you want to dig more into this, check out podcast number 23 and the film The Islands and the Whales, which you can rent on Vimeo. Uh, you can also find the link in the show notes. I was very keen to understand how mercury was getting into the oceans as I was putting this article together. And so I reached out to Zhen Shu Sung on the back of the paper that he was a part of. He began by explaining the emission sources for mercury. And like uh, uh, coal burning, like uh, um, other uh, coal mining, and mercury mining, and uh, many other kind of in- industrial sources. So these uh, emissions go to the atmosphere uh, and also can be released to rivers and the coastal regions. So all these kind of emissions can go to the ocean. So, as you'd probably guessed, it's primarily from burning fossil fuels, with coal being by far the biggest contributor. Although, as you will hear as you get to the end of this podcast, there is also a very considerable impact from gold mining. Current trends indicate that the concentration of mercury in our oceans will double in the next 10 years. Shen Shu explained to me how the atmospheric pathways lead to our oceans and highlights how the oxidization of mercury in our atmosphere is more easily dissolved by precipitation. So basically, there are two forms of mercury in, in the atmosphere. So one is the elemental, basically it's like a vapor. Uh, like we used the mercury in our thermometer, so we see that's kind of the silver color thing. That's basically element of mercury. And oh, the second form is oxidized one. Oxidized one is kind of kind of different animal here. So it's uh, compared with elemental vapor. So the oxidized one is more dissolvable. So that means it can be scavenged by rain or snow. So basically, this uh, makes the mercury uh, in the atmosphere can go into the ocean by, we call that deposition. That means, uh, basically means kind of scavenged by rain and snow, this kind of thing. So overall, so the mercury enters into the ocean into different pathways. So atmospheric deposition, probably the most important one, and the river discharge, and then coastal region discharge. Kind of, they are the most important three pathways here. Now we understand how it gets into our oceans, but what is the big deal here? 
Well, we know that the element of mercury itself is not as much of a concern as monomethyl mercury, which is formed from mercury deposits by the action of microbes that live in aquatic systems. In this form, a mercury atom attached to a methyl group, it becomes bioaccumulative, a toxic pollutant which can build in the food chain in ever-increasing concentrations, first diffusing into plankton, then consumed by other organisms, which in turn are predated on through the complexities of the oceanic food web. As a result of this, there is a tendency for higher mercury concentrations in older, larger animals. Shen Xu explained to me how methyl mercury gets into plankton in the first place. Uh, then we go to more detail in the, kind of the two steps. The first step is basically from sea water to the bacteria and the phytoplankton. So this process is quite uh, fast. So we know that because of the, 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 this kind of phytoplankton bacteria have a single cell form of life. So they are, you know, the, the, their cells are directly exposed to the seawater. So there is a large, kind of basically, uh, surface area to volume ratio over there. So the uh, enter of uh, the methylmercury enter into the kind of cell brains quite fast. They get the equilibrium outside and inside of the concentration probably in less than a day or so. Um, and then we also found that uh, the the size really matters. We know that the smaller the cell, then we know that for the given value, the the unit surface area per volume actually is larger. So that makes it kind of more easily to absorb the you know, mesomercury inside of the cell. Something I had never been clear on was what proportion of mercury is passed on through the food chain when one species consumes another. This is known as assimilation efficiency. Is when we consider, for example, one gram of uh, mesomercury is digested by our, our life, then how much of this mesomercury stay in the inside of the body of this kind of life? How what well, the remainder will be kind of excretion uh, or kind of get outside of the body? So this is kind of the key. So this number actually is really high for mesomercury. I'm think close to eighty percent or ninety percent. So uh, when we say the in the traffic higher traffic levels, the concentration is higher. The, the key question here is that the assimilation efficiency is so high. So basically, that when a life digests any mercury in their body, it stays there. So when with this kind of uh, this kind of life or kind of traffic levels, animals this go larger, go older. So they are accumulated more mercury over the years. And so that basically makes the uh, bioaccumulation kind of so. Uh, so part, so kind of substantial over there. With that information, my next question is, well, how does it affect people? So we know the most toxic form is the mesomercury. That's a, a mercury uh, atom combined with a carbon and three hydrogen atoms. So because it uh, uh, can be kind of confused by our cells, they, they think it's kind of very similar, the structure similar to an amino acid. So we think mm, it's a kind of a nutrient. So the, the, the cell plasma really kind of highly affinity to combine with this chemical. So it makes the mesomercury already trouble to uh, human health for wildlife. As a way of closing out the discussion, I asked Shan Shu to give a little more historical context to the rise in mercury concentrations in our oceans and explain what the future looks like if we want to tackle the problem. Uh, okay, so for the first question, it's basically about the historical trend. So clearly, so from the pre-industrial, uh, sorry, from the pre-industrial level through the industrial revolution, so we clearly see a rapid increase of uh, mesomercury concentrations in uh, many of the biological samples. So for example, we have uh, collected uh, um, a lot of uh, samples from, especially for the Arctic region, because of the, its uh, low temperature environment, that kind of preserve the mesomercury over there. So we connected a lot of uh, samples from, for example, the polar bear, polar bear fur, and also from the, the teeth of many of the sharks, and also the uh, the hair of the kind of the people living in that area. So we clearly found uh, maybe uh, maybe ten times increase of mesomercury concentrations in this kind of uh, samples from maybe one hundred years ago at the pre to present day. So this is really clear increase in. Uh, level of the mesomercury over there. So we know this kind of will cause a lot of trouble, uh, especially for human 
that uh, eat a lot of seafood or fish. For example, the, the, the community in the Inuit and also some coast people with a large kind of seafood consumption. So they, they're causing a lot of, lot of trouble there. Uh, so because of this, so unfortunately we have had a, a legal ban legally binding convention that's called uh, the Minamata Convention. Um, so the Minamata is a, a place in Japan that's where the first uh, methylmercury poison events happened. So I think it's a thousand of people died from that kind of poison events. So kind of to memorize uh, this kind of the people, the victim of this, uh, this kind of tragedy event. So we kind of uh, honor, so we kind of name this kind of convention after this, this place. So this convention basically uh, took effect in 2017. Uh, it uh, kind of had a lot of uh, provisions to control the mercury emissions. For example, uh, they they have kind of conven had a uh, provision to kind of ban all the mercury mining and mercury mining activities, and also kind of phase out of the mercury use in many products and the industrial process. For example, the thermometer with mercury now is not allowed to use, and also the um, the many of the mercury in many of the per industrial production, such as the uh, crow alkali production, so they are also going to ban uh, in recent years or in the next decade. And also, we know the, the, the one of the largest sources of mercury from coal mining, sorry, the coal burning. So then uh, the, the convention requires the use the best available technology and the best environment practice to control these emissions from this you know, fossil fuel combustion. We, because that's why we, we cannot ban fossil fuel combustion, but it's still our you kind know, of basic energy source. So we just need to you kind know, of use the you kind know, of best available control technology to uh, abate the emissions from these kind of sources. Uh, and uh, another kind of uh, promotion very important is that the uh, the small scale or artisanal gold mining. That's basically uh, especially in uh, developing countries, uh, like in the South Asia and the South America. So this kind of people using kind of uh, the raw mercury, basically the mercury, uh, animal mercury, that's basically is a liquid form, use that to extract gold from the uh, the mercury kind of mine rolls. So that's actually uh, emit a lot of mercury to the environment. Basically now it's the uh, uh, most important source even larger than the coal burning. You can, it's a totally different from the greenhouse gas emission story. So the artisanal and small-scale gold mining is the most important source. But however, the because this kind of, uh, because gold is so expensive and kind of so profitable, so the this kind of country is kind of basically reluctant to really ban this kind of uh, uh, activities. So the, the convention also is kind of uh, have some uncertainty there. So they left the different countries to make their uh, national action plan. And then, but then how uh, will it go in the future is kind of some uncertainty over there. Uh, and then go back to your second question here is how will it be in the future? So I think that the, the um, I'm personally, I'm kind, kind of optimistic there. So we know that many of the sources um, are really kind of, uh, kind of banned and controlled by the Minamata Convention. And then the larger source, kind of coal burning, is currently going down right now. So one reason is because of many of the uh, the coal-fired power plants, they kind of foresee that the kind of the, the convention will make a kind of hard hit on them. So they kind of voluntarily kind of install many kind of mercury control uh, devices, and also the controlling of other uh, con other pollutants like uh, sulfur dioxide or kind of particle matters also help also help to reduce mercury emission as well. So think of this kind of emission from this kind of sources kind of already going down. And also the phase out of mercury in the products and the, the industrial process also kind of already took effect. So given the uncertainty in the artisanal small scale gold mining, so we already say the mer total mercury emissions probably can already go start to going down uh, in the past maybe two decades or so. So in the future, so we can definitely kind of project this kind of uh, decreasing trend. Um, I think uh, the, the, the decreasing trend will not be as fast as we kind of generally 
and expected. So the one, but we clearly we see the unsurprising source of weakness slightly going down. But one question I want to warn or kind of uh, make attention here is that uh, as the mercury is very different from uh, like uh, our air pollution or other kind of pollution. So the reason is that uh, uh, the mercury is an element, so it cannot be really kind of breaking down in our environment. So when the mercury emitted to the atmosphere, to the ocean, they will always there. So when, when you kind of really uh, cut down the anthropogenic emissions, the our historic emissions are kind of still existing in our environment. So when we say maybe in the next uh, several decades, when we cut down all the anthropogenic emissions, you know, kind of most optimistic scenarios, so we see the mercury still in, in the environment. So that makes the uh, the mercury problem more persistent than, one, than we thought. So, uh, so with that in mind, we know that the, the short answer is that clearly the concentration in our environment will going down with our kind of successful control of many of the emission activities thanks to the uh, global convention. But the concentration will kind of not uh, the decreasing trend will as sharp as the emission control and the concentration. Uh, contributed by the legacy sources and the historical sources, we will still continue to uh, make trouble in the kind of future decades. What a fascinating conversation. I hope that you all understand a little more about the problems of mercury in our oceans now. If you want to hear an extended section on the science of how methyl mercury is formed, keep on listening as I've tagged it on to the end of this show. Otherwise, thank you once again for tuning in. Join me in a week's time when we talk to Merlin Becker from the GWCT in our long-form podcast. So uh, it's a very good good question, and uh, but unfortunately, I think that our kind of scientific community still do, does not have an exact clear answer here. Uh, the the we but we kind of kind of narrowed down the kind of possible. Uh, answers to that we know some certain bacteria activities is kind of uh, uh, responsible for this kind of methylation process. So we first uh, uh, found that some some bacteria, especially uh, sulfur reducing bacteria in sediments. So sediments can exist in the bottom of the river and the bottom of the ocean or lake. So in this kind of environment, it basically is anaerobic. That means no oxygen there. So we know that this kind of uh, uh, bacteria can transfer the inorganic mercury to methyl mercury. Um, and I think in recent couple of years, as the kind of the science evolves, we found some kind of uh, uh, certain genes, like uh, we call HGCA, HGCB, this kind of genes are found to kind of facilitate this kind of mercury methylation. And we also did the environmental experiment that when we delete this kind of genes, the sulfur reducing bacteria can no longer kind of mess with, mess with mercury. So it's, it's quite clear that these kind of two genes are responsible for mercury methylation. But this is still not a full story. When we go to the environment, for example, for the, in, the, in the ocean, we, we found a lot of mesomercury concentration in the water column. So in this kind of environment, we know that it's far away from the sediment, right? Because the sediment is the first that we recognize as kind of mercury methylation. But when we go to the water columns, we, we didn't find too much this kind of HGCA, HGCB genes there. And also the environment there is totally different from the, the sediment. We know it's, uh, it's not anaerobic. The oxygen level is quite high there. So that makes it kind of now mis still kind of mystery. It requires more uh, research to find how kind of exactly the uh, the, the mercury come converted to metal mercury. So this kind of uh, uh, talking about my uh, back to my paper here is that uh, so our paper is basically is a kind of modeling paper. So uh, the, the the model is is kind of uh, is a numerical tools that uh, kind of track the mercury uh, emitted and the deposit from the atmosphere and see how it uh, evolved in the, in the ocean. And then we make a, a lot of parameterization assumptions to see how the mercury transforms. And then eventually we constrain our assumptions and the par parameterization with observations and then adjust our model to kind of minimize the discrepancy 
So with this, we can um, kind of narrow down. So what kind of environment is kind of most kind of possible to generate a lot of metal mercury, and which are a lot. So uh, with this, so we, we probably we don't need exactly what's the kind of uh, the bacteria is responsible for methylation, but we are using some bulk bulk bacterial activity as a kind of, as, as a proxy. For example, here in our, in, in our study, we use the, the the how fast the bacteria using organic carbon as a food and a carbon source for them to use this activity to uh, to kind of to simulate how fast the mesomercury methylation process will happen. And then we also combine with other process and get a kind of a plausible uh, explanation there. So we found that the, the mesomercury uh, is produced in the most at the biological active regions. And then we also found the kind of environment like the polar regions that has a, a low temperature is like a free refrigerator. So when the mesomercury is generated, they kind of freeze there and then kind of uh, preserve the mesomercury for a longer time. And we also found in the surface ocean, uh, because of the, the photochemical, the, the solar radiation is so strong that it breaks down the mesomercury. So we are kind of uh, the, use the model as a tool to glue these different pieces together to give all the most plausible explanations how the mercury is converted to mesomercury.